Peter, this is one of my favorite places in Philadelphia. Oh, so I want you to know it's one of my favorite things to have you with me in Philadelphia. Wow, you're yes, too so. kind. Thank you, sir. <laughs> the reason why this is one of my favorite places is because we are standing in front of perhaps one of the most iconic uh, images of the American Revolution, and that's Independence Hall. There it is. This is a very, very important building. What, what, why is this building so important? What was accomplished there? Well, one of the things I love to start with when I think about this building is that it's a twin. It was born in the year in which somebody named George Washington was born. Is that right? 1732, they are twins so for the American story. So this was not only a great place for the American story, but it's a great place for the Pennsylvania story that was a colony of England, the United Kingdom. William Penn's family brought about this. It's a great story, I can't tell it here. But what we do want to know is that this was to show it was a significant place, Philadelphia, capital city, a large colony, and they built a magnificent Georgian building. By Georgian, meaning perfectly symmetrical. Every part is balanced on the other side, and it's, so it's lovely right from the beginning. And this was really on the edge of town, right? That's right. At it's, the time it was built? That's right. So you would think uh, getting closer to the Delaware River is where the city hall would have been. And so we were farther out. They had a sense that the city would expand to reach this edge and go beyond it. But what makes it amazing is not just because of its colonial history, but it's because it's the place where our nation was born. On the first floor, when you look at the front, the lower room to the left is the birthplace of the United States because it's where the Declaration of Independence was argued and voted. And then some years later, it's where the Constitution of the United States was established. So they were both in the same room? Both in the same room, both in the same building, and both absolutely essential to explain who we are as Americans. Our freedom, and then the ordering of that freedom, which is our constitutional or federal government. So Washington defended that in the uh, Revolutionary War, and he presided over it at the Constitutional Convention. And this building, of course, was known as the Pennsylvania State House, until many years later, after the French Revolution, Washington's young French officer, Lafayette, came back, survived all the struggles in Europe. Washington had long gone on to his reward, and he spoke about the joy of being back in this free country. And he said, and there's that great hall of independence. So Lafayette coined the phrase he Independence did. Hall. So he called it the Hall of Independence, and the newspaper said, the Hall of Independence is Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And so Lafayette named the building years later, but aptly named, uh, named by just identification, it became what the world knows it as today. The birthplace of independence, the declaration and the constitution, two documents that are exemplars for the whole world. They sought to do something that had never been done before and it's still going strong. Well, and no wonder that uh, George Washington was uh, considered the father of our country, not only being the uh, general that, that led the revolution, the Revolutionary War, but also was presiding over the formation of our Constitution. That's well said. He was called that name, the father of his country, in his own lifetime. And so when this meeting for the Constitution came here, he was no longer the young military hero that showed up in the Declaration era. They wanted him to preside, and they said, you're in charge. And some would argue that as the Constitution was being developed in the article in the executive, they thought of what kind of powers would we want a man like Washington to have to govern the country. So he is there in spirit, not by name, but they knew who he was and wanted him to lead. But that makes this building extraordinarily important for now, our Now, when the revolution history. was over, did they continue to use this building as, the, a, as a seat of government? Yes, this continued to be the, the seat of government from time to time. And at, you need to realize as uh, Washington was defending the liberty of the country, there was the famous Battle of Brandywine. That's the first. This is a few miles one. south of Philadelphia. That's right. So there's the first 9/11. We all know 9/11 in modern history, but the first 9/11 was when Washington lost in the battle with the British at Brandywine. He had to retreat. That eventually took them up to Valley Forge, but it also meant that Philadelphia was undefended, and the British just walked right in. Congress had to flee for their lives. So this building was not headquarters anymore. anymore. It actually ended up being a place where the British relaxed and some of the war uh, criminals, heroes as they saw them, depending on which side, were upstairs. It became a hospital for a while and some of the uh, wood was burned so that they could be warm. So it was 
captured enemy territory. Well, one of the things that I find amazing about the Battle of Brandywine, even though we can say, well, uh, the Americans lost that battle, but it's a credit to George Washington's leadership. And we'll say more about this in a future session when we're at Valley Forge. But the fact that he had the leadership to keep an army in the field, to keep them together, because uh, they were overwhelmed by the British. And uh, when they, they, they had left Brandywine and came up here, um, if you were a betting man, you'd say, I wouldn't bet on this army. They and were, yet Washington somehow kept them in the field. Yeah. They were hungry. Washington described them as naked, meaning they had inadequate clothing. They were discouraged. Congress had fled. They weren't paid. And they had to make their own way where there was nothing but wilderness. They had to make their own homes. And it was just right in the beginning of winter. What a difficult time. Well, we'll see what that when we get to, to What Valley a leader Forge. he had yes, to be to pull exactly. them together. Yeah. So, but eventually the British left Philadelphia. And so our government came back, obviously, eventually to use this building for the Constitution. Yeah, that's right. But the Declaration of Independence, if, if, if I remember correctly in, in reading the de Declaration, that God is mentioned four different times in that document. Isn't that true? That is absolutely right. In fact, it's interesting. There was a, a young high school teacher who was teaching civics and said, let's take a look at what our founding document says about God. And he pointed out the references to God. He was later fired he was for fired, establishing religion. But this is just history. I mean, this is political. It's, it's, this is the founding document Anybody of our can country. embrace this. So what it shows us is that our nation had a theistic beginning. They were conscious that what they were doing was re relevant not only to people but to the sovereign of the universe. And so when you look at it, there's four references to deity. And they're worthy of summarizing. And I think every Christian and every patriot ought to know these. So number one. We're endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. And the word is unalienable. That's unalienable, right. not inalienable. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> you can spell that right and put the U on front That's of it. Right. Okay. And what, is, what does it mean to be endowed by your Creator? Well, the book of Genesis. The Bible tells us in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's an affirmation of God's sovereign creation over all things. Then it goes on to say that what we are endowed with by our Creator, our life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are the elements of the image of God. That's also Genesis 1. There's a God who made us in His image with these rights that no one can take away from us because they're given to us by God. So then they're not goes, given to us by the government or by a court. These are unalienable and they can't be taken away because they're given by Him. So we, we need to understand that, that when someone says, the government gives you your rights, you say, well, not in America. They are given to us by God. Because if they're given by the government, they can be taken away by the government that's just right. as easily that's as right. they give it. I think a famous line that has been said, a government that's big enough to give anything you want is big enough to take away everything Everything you, you have. have. <laughs> that's right. And, and in the Marxist ideology, they want a bigger and bigger government because there is no God. Ultimately, the government is, is God. God. And you are going to deal with the absolute authority of a singularity of power. And that's what we want to prevent from happening and, and here. the individual significant. We are endowed by our Creator, certain inalienable rights. So as you think about that language of God, the Creator, then it goes on to say, there are the laws of nature and of nature's God. And they said the laws of nature, they had understood by now the discovery of the Christian physicist, Sir Isaac Newton, who had given us the laws of gravitation, the laws of optics, they had studied the beginnings of modern physics. We know these laws, but there's not only laws of nature in the natural world, there's the laws of God. What are those? Those are the Ten Commandments. They come to us from Mount Sinai. That's the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20. So Genesis and Exodus, and then you go a little bit further because they were being accused of being rebels, rabble rousers. They were overthrowing government, revolutionaries in the worst sense. They said, for the rectitude of our intentions, that is for the ethical propriety of what we're doing. So the rightness or the justice of what we're doing, yep. because people accuse them, why are you doing this? You can't do this, exactly this is illegal. Right. That's exactly it. What did they do? They appealed to the supreme judge of the world. There's one almighty God. Okay, who's God himself. And that brings us to the idea that there's an ultimate judgment at the end of history. So we now have the beginning and the, and the end, end of, of biblical already. with the law of God. And if you look with care, if you remember the time of history we're in, the 1700s, this is largely a Protestant America. There were Roman Catholics here, but they were post-Reformational. 
still knowing the Bible as part of their educational system. And if you asked anybody at that time, who is the one that judges at the end of history? They would say, wait a second, isn't it the Son of Man who will separate the sheep from the goats? Uh, didn't he say that all authority has been given to the Son by the Father so that you honor the Son even as you honor the Father? That's a reference to Jesus Christ in our founding document. With those who have eyes to see, it not but only that was has, the consensus view of most people living in America. It's at the time. easy to say that over, not forced by the government. No, that just was their world. That was the legacy of the uh, immigrants, by and large. They brought the Protestant tradition in its many variations to the New World. And then finally, the fourth reference to God. At the very end, it says, "And we are going to rely on the protection of divine providence." Providence was just what we just talked about at the beginning of the session. That's great. That's right. So providence is this wonderful truth that God governs in the affairs of men, that God has his rule and his sustaining power at work at all times. And when you talk about providence, you're talking about the executive aspect of God, the fact that God is working. So if you put those four references together, you have now outlined a basic Christian worldview, the creator, the one who's given us standards to live by, one who's judging and working through all the way of history until the ultimate judgment at the end of history. Providence brings it all together from beginning to end based upon the nature of God himself. That's a Christian worldview. It and it's written for anyone to read in that founding document that is dated July 4th, 1776. And I'd like to note that that last one uh, about divine providence, firm reliance of divine providence. Wasn't that one suggested by the only clergyman that was uh, working on the Declaration well, of Well, you raise an interesting point because Thomas Jefferson, who had the privilege to draft the first version of the Declaration over the Graff House, not just too many blocks from here, he sat down and wrote it. And when he brought it in, it had one reference to God. When it was done, it had four. four. <laughs> <laughs> so there was some theology going on in that beginning. And so the question is, why would there be a reference to providence at the end? Well, it just so happens there is a man by the name of John Witherspoon who had been the president of the College of New Jersey. We know it today as Princeton University. And he had just preached his last sermon before coming here. And before he came here, he preached his congregation about how important it was to trust in divine providence. In fact, he said, you cannot be just a cultural Christian. What we're getting ready to vote on might cost you your lives. He said, normally I don't bring politics into the pulpit, but I must today. You must have a faith in Jesus Christ who died for sinners because your eternal destiny is based upon that alone as we face these times of war and conflict. What a sermon. Well, he had just preached on providence and he recognized that we were going up against the world's strongest and richest nation as a ragtag group of colonists. And, he and that, that in itself is a miracle. <laughs> How in the world that we were able to go up against an army like that? And then, then you have to ask the question, uh, what kind of faith did it take for them to believe that God would deliver? Well, one who believes in providence. Witherspoon was a Presbyterian minister. He knew the doctrine of providence as a core doctrine of his faith. He believed that God was at work. And so he said, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we pledge to one another our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So he believed that God would deliver his people. And of course, I would add, the favorite doctrine of George Washington was the doctrine of providence. Over 300 times it's found in his writings. So from the preacher to the patriot general, there's a common link in the very last affirmation of deity and the declaration. I hope we have a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence today. It gives courage, it gives commitments to stability, and the willingness to follow the laws of God when the whole world stands against them, because God is sovereign and He is just. And when that judgment day comes, as that bumper sticker says, Jesus wins. Well, amen to that. <laughs>